few more really interesting segments. We're going to start off the afternoon with uh, John Aidey. John's president of ABYC, American Boat and Yacht Council. Uh, you, anybody who was here last year remembers John. He gave us a great presentation. He's going to do that again this year. Um, just to shorten up a little bit about who John is, John previously served as a technical director in managing major boating safety grants for the U.S. Coast Guard and overseeing boating, safety sta boating standards development. He was promoted to vice president of ABYC in 2009 and then became president in 2012. John has his master's in business administration with a specialty in nonprofit organization management. Been applicable in a few of the businesses I've owned, the nonprofit part. Um, ABYC certified master technician. John's widely respected for his far reaching technical expertise in boat construction and repair, as well as the ability to work with diverse interests in recreational boating arena. John's going to help us sort out alphabet soup. Thank you, Paul. All right. All right. So, welcome to song. Yeah, welcome to one of the most boring topics in boating, guys. And I get to present it, so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Paul called me. How many of you had to sit through me last year? All right. Yeah. Don't don't be so enthusiastic when you raise your hands. So. Paul called me and actually asked me to, to rack my brain a little bit about a topic that uh, is something that I've kind of ignored for my last 15 years at ABYC, but I think it's something that's getting closer and closer all the time. This is the difference between a classification society versus a standards organization. So you're looking at an, an MCA or an ABS versus uh, an ABYC type, uh, type organization. So what I hope I've done is put together a, a nice brief overview without the gory details as we go through, but um, the first thing I wanted to to do is actually talk about uh, why we need standards anyway. Now, there's not a lot of funny stuff when it comes down to standards, but we found this little clip and we've used it a couple times. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do this for you really quick to kind of get you in the mood to listen to this Sir, stuff. Thanks for coming in. It's, it's a great pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. This ship that was involved in the incident off Western Australia this week. Yeah, the one the front it, fell off. Yeah. Yeah, that's not very typical. I'd like to make that point. Well, how is it untypical? Well, there are a lot of these ships going around the world all the time, and very seldom does anything like this happen. I just don't want people thinking that tankers aren't safe. Was this tanker safe? Well, I was thinking more about the other ones. The ones that are safe? Yeah, the ones the front doesn't fall off. Well, if this wasn't safe, why did it have 80,000 tonnes of oil on it? Well, I'm not saying it wasn't safe. It's just perhaps not quite as safe as some of the other ones. Why? Well, some of them are built so the front doesn't fall off at all. Well, wasn't this built so the front wouldn't fall off? Well, obviously not. How do you know? Well, because the front fell off and 20,000 tonnes of crude oil spilled into the sea court fire. It's a bit of a giveaway. I'd just like to make the point that that is not normal. Well, what sort of standards are these uh, oil tankers built to? Oh, very rigorous maritime engineering standards. What sort of thing? Well, the front's not supposed to fall off for a start. <laughs> and what other things? Well, there are uh, regulations governing the uh, materials that they can be made of. What materials? Well, cardboard's out. And? No cardboard derivatives. Like paper? No paper. No string, no sellotape. Rubber? No, rubber's out. Um, they've got to have a steering wheel. There's a minimum crew requirement. What's the minimum crew? Oh, one, I suppose. So the allegations that they're just designed to carry as much oil as possible, uh, oh, all the consequences, I mean, that's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. These are very, very strong vessels. So what happened in this case? Well, the front fell off in this case, by all means, but it's very unusual. But Senator Collins, why did the front book fall off? Well, a wave hit it. A wave hit it? A wave hit the ship. Is that unusual? Oh, yeah. At sea, chance of a million. So what do you do to protect the environment in cases well, like this? the ship was towed outside the environment. Into another environment? No, no, no. It's been towed beyond the environment. Yeah, not it's not in the environment. A, no, but from one environment to another environment. No, it's beyond the environment. It's not in an environment. It's well, been towed be beyond the environment. Well, what's out there? Nothing's out there. Well, there must be something there. There is nothing out there. All there is is sea and birds and fish. And? And 20,000 tonnes of crude oil. And what else? And a fire. And anything else? And the part of the ship that the front fell off. But there's nothing else out there. Senator Collins, thanks for joining us. complete void. Yeah. We're out of time. The environment's perfectly safe. We're out of time? Yeah. Can you book me a cab? But didn't you come in a Commonwealth car? Yes, I did. What happened? No, well, the front fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're all ready to go, We'll start talking about classification societies and standards and what the difference is between them. So we need to start way back. This is a topic that goes back uh, hundreds of years, actually. So the IMO is the organization that's going to dictate this. And I think it's worth noting that the, the purview of the IMO and SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea, is really, from a large percentage standpoint, is commercial. 
Uh, it's, it's tankers, it's freighters, it's stuff where the front fell off, it's all of that. And that's really what their prime directive is. Uh, Solus started right after the Titanic disaster with numbers of light boats and things like that, and it just grew and grew and grew into some very rigorous standards uh, as we move forward. But IMO is the organization that controls this, and that's the one that all of these classification societies that we're going to talk about in a minute are responsible to and responsible for compliance. So as we get through the alphabet soup, as Paul likes to call it, IMO is one of the first ones on your list. Now as we move on, I just picked some of the big guys here. These are what are called the classification societies. Okay? These are the groups that will operate in a couple different ways uh, across the world. Um, we have uh, Germanizer Lloyd, we have uh, Det Norske Veritas, those are one company now. Lloyd's Register, uh, Arena Services, Bureau Veritas, and American Bureau of Shipping. It's important to note here that these are not insurance companies. Okay? Lloyd's Register is different than Lloyd's of London. Okay. These are the groups that the insurance companies will look to to decide whether they want to take the risk on the vessel or not. So um, it, it's kind of an interesting story about Lloyd's. It began, as they say, in a coffee shop where a bunch of guys were sitting together saying that their freight was getting lost between uh, Europe and anywhere else. And they decided they need some kind of standard so that when they put their freight on some kind of boat, it had to meet something. It wasn't going to fall off. The you know, front wasn't going to fall off. It wasn't going to sink. All sorts of things weren't going to happen. That's where it started. Lloyd's being the oldest. Um, and the newest on here is uh, ABS around 1880. So really, it's, it's a, an old school type of group that's out there. And again, primarily commercial. Uh, but these, the interesting thing about these, if you go to ABYC, you have a five day free trial of our standards. And after that, we want you to be a member. You have to pay for it. You go to these guys' documents, you can get them all for nothing. This is not where they make their money, folks. They make their money on the certification, the recertification, the looking at it every year. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can get their construction requirements for nothing thing off their website so you can see what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of engineering uh, standards they do right. MCA is probably one of the most misunderstood groups out there. This is the British standards writer. Okay? They write standards for use by a number of different organizations. They are not, however, a classification society. They don't have surveyors that come out and look at the uh, yachts. They don't have design services that look at the design before the, the keel is laid. Um, they are used by a number of countries who don't have the engineering expertise to be able to have their own set of standards. So uh, Bali, for instance, if you have anybody that's flagged, uh, flagged something there, they use it. Um, and any really odd Bimini is another one uh, that's, that uses them. But there's a lot of places that use the MCA code. LY3 is, is uh, what it's actually called. But that's what MCA does. So I know when I started to do this work, thanks again, Paul, um, that uh, MCA was a little confusing to me. Now, another reason I was interested in doing this presentation was because we do have a member of ours who is out of Brussels who is actually looking to create one of the first new classification societies in probably 50 or 60 years. Um, this member has, has gone to Malta. And uh, so far, Malta is, is doing well with getting the, uh, the permission through for him to do this. But he is actually going to use 90% ABYC standards for a classification society, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, so what you're looking at is a very, a very low price um, uh, cost to entry. You're looking at a low cost on, on uh, recertifying the vessel every year, because these are things that can be done by marine surveyors, of course, with caveats and things. But we're pretty excited about being involved in that. Uh, we hope to see that come to fruition in the next couple years. So kind of the lines are going to blur a little bit uh, as we move forward with some of these. But I, I thought MCA was worth noting just because for me anyway, I always thought it was a classification society, but it is absolutely not. So the main difference is, and this is a little hard to see, but if you take a look at class versus standards, so we're talking about voluntary standards, ISO standards, anything that's designed to a standard versus designed to a class. The class is more of a circular argument uh, when it comes to uh, how, it's, how it's used. So hopefully the, uh, the designer is designing to a particular class, so uh, uh, an individual comes and wants to have a keel laid on a boat, wants to get something started, they're going to start up with a class immediately if they ever want the boat insured. This is where the hammer is for a recreational boat. If you want to get your boat insured, generally it's got to meet something. And right now, the, the currency of the realm is a classification society for, let's say, 140, 150 and up. Okay, and that's just generally what I was looking at. Of course, you can do smaller and larger, and we'll talk about some of those sizes in a minute. But really, from design to construction to inspection, they continue to do this, but it never ends. It's done annually, 
If there's a major refit, they want to be involved in the design so that they can okay it before it actually gets started and then it gets inspected again as it goes forward. From a standards perspective, the standards are involved in the design. No one goes and looks at a design, especially here in the United States, okay? It's built. Someone may come out and look at it if the, if the builder decides they want to do that. It may or may not be inspected as it's put on the water or sold. You never know, okay? If uh, someone's working with the NMMA certification, they may have the NMMA come in and take a look at it and put the NMMA certified label on it. Uh, some of the builders I know that are not involved in that actually have in-house surveyors that will come out and take a look at it or people they have a relationship with where they come in and inspect it to the ABYC standards. ISO is a self-certification to a certain limit where you actually have people on staff that have to go and self-certify that it meets the recreational craft directive, which is the rule in, uh, in Europe. And then it's used. And it may be surveyed again when it's sold, depending on the bank requirements and the insurance requirements. Or it, if it stays in the same family, it may never be inspected again. You never know what's going to happen. Versus the class society, where everything is continuously upgraded. Okay. So what I wanted to do was pick out some of the major construction differences so we could kind of bring it down to a level where we understand. I, we've, ABYC has been accused of being a little too lax for big boats. But ABS and Lloyd's and some of the other ones have been accused of being a little too more, a little too robust for some of these boats. So unfortunately, some of the boats that you're selling now fall in this gray area where you could use ABYC if the insurance company agrees, or you can go with a classification society, or someone can buy a boat that's been classed and maintained at class, uh, and then they decide they want to go to uh, an ABYC style uh, standards if the insurance company will allow it. So we're going to talk quickly about range and weather limits. Uh, and the standard size, other than ISO, which has a uh, category A, B, C, and D, uh, ABYC has no range in weather limits. We don't discuss that. Um, we've been accused in Europe of having a, a cowboy mentality, if you will, where we let the, uh, we let the commerce take care of it. Uh, if you have a boat company who continuously has transoms falling off, then that boat company is going to be in business for how much longer? Uh, it kind of solves itself at this point. If we have lots of boat companies where the transoms are falling off, what happens? we write a voluntary standard for it and we try to solve it. Okay, so we have a way of dealing with these things. Uh, in Europe, they want to be told. Category D is a small lake or a pond. Category A is some big offshore type of boat. Okay, so depending on what's going on, the standard is going to be different for the category that you're going for. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit more. When you go with the classification society, you have full IMO compliance. Okay, that's what the designator's for. You want to make sure you comply completely with the SOLAS requirements as dictated by IMO. Um, from an ABYC standpoint, when we write standards, very rarely do we look at SOLAS or do we look at IMO compliance. It's really not something that's on our radar at this point. Same with ISO. Uh, ISO is not terribly concerned with IMO compliance or, uh, or SOLAS. So no size limit. You can build a ship as big as you can possibly build it. You can do recreational. You can do commercial. Um, we have size limits mainly in ISO, um, but we also have a couple standards in ABYC that have size limits, really small stuff, 20 feet, 26 feet, flotation capacity, those kinds of things. Um, recreational and commercial, again, more commercial than recreational just because of the vast number of commercial vessels out there. Uh, generally recreational for, um, for standards. Uh, specifically, ISO does say recreational. Uh, ABYC, however, really, you just don't know. Um, anybody familiar with tow boats and subchapter M of the 46 CFR? Okay, the 46 CFR recently came out and said you have to build your boat to something and you have to maintain it to something. ABYC is in that mix of standards that you can use to build and maintain your boat. So there's commercial. Uh, we get calls from the Navy all the time. We get calls from the Army and NOAA where they're getting ready to build a new set of boats, the Coast Guard, and they want to put ABYC standards into the RFP, the request for uh, proposal on the boats that they're building. So we have a gray area when it comes to that. Uh, we talked about this in the life cycle. It's a day of build on the standard side, uh, sale approach or the lifetime approach. They want to know that that boat is safe its entire life when you're looking at the classification society model. And then really this is an interesting point. Prescriptive standards versus performance standards. So let's go back to the example of uh, cardboard and, and tape that, uh, that our friend used in our video in the beginning. So ABYC is not going to come out and say no cardboard, no tape. ABYC is going to come out with 16 ASTM tests that tell you that you're supposed to use something other than cardboard, and cardboard wouldn't pass. Why do we do that? It's the cowboy mentality again. We're going to let innovation run wild, but we're going to tell them what our bare minimum expectations are, and we're going to do it through testing and, and kind of 
par you know, parenthetical examples of what you can do and what you can't do. We're not going to come out and say that all boats must be fiberglass, all boats must be aluminum. Okay? There are certain areas where if you do use aluminum, we're going to ask for a certain thickness or a certain grade. Okay, but when it comes to classification societies, as we'll go over in a little bit more detail in a minute, there are some very specific things that engineers have to go through. Uh, the U.S. recreational boating economy is basically built on pioneers in the industry who may have been farmers or they may have been uh, veterans coming back from World War II. I mean, these are the icons that we look at in some of these boats. They weren't built by engineers. Okay, you can't do a class boat without a set of engineers. Okay, University of Michigan graduates immediately start building classification society boats because that's what they know. Okay, and that's what's going on up there. So, and then again, the prescriptive and performance standards. So let's look at some examples. Um, this is actually kind of an interesting story. Does anybody know what this boat is? So um, we recently started dealing with a boat donation uh, program at ABYC. So I'll just put a little plug in here. If you ever have somebody that needs to donate a boat, uh, ABYC can take it. And uh, if we do use it in our mission, which is education or what have you, your, uh, your donor gets the uh, full NADA value for the tax write-off, which is kind of a nice thing for us. That's why we like working with this group. But um, this group got this as a donation in that particular state. That's where it sits. So they're trying to sell this, but the question is, do you go from here and go to a class society? Do you go to a standards type basis? What do you do with this particular boat? So we're gonna go through some examples uh, just to give you an idea of, of what this particular boat might face. This is 135 foot steel something or other. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I can't imagine they'll find a buyer for it. One of the interesting things that they do here, I think really the, the point was to, to be able to get that recreational use boat in there was weather and range. And we talked about it very briefly in the last slide or so. There are expectations that these boats can handle certain types of waves. They have a Beaufort scale rating in there. They have a wave scale rating in there. They also talk about something called a short range vessel, which old school was 500 gross tons. As of 2005, it's 300 gross tons. Okay, they talk about where you can go, and where you can't go. So uh, you 60 miles from a uh, from a, a port is really the accepted one from safe harbor. Although you can go up to 90 miles, depending on what the inspector recommends when they go ahead and take a look at it. So the short range vessel is uh, really the um, uh, the recreational type boat for this. Okay, 60 to 90 miles offshore or, or far uh, away from safe harbor, excuse me. And then obviously different types of, uh, of wave height and wind forces and things like that. Sail is a little bit different than power. So when it comes to CE versus ABYC on this range, ABYC again states nothing about wind, weather, those types of things. We have a very small wind chart in our strong points document where it talks about the size of the superstructure and how much windage you may have and, and how much your permanent mooring load may have to carry. We have that, but we don't ever tell a boat company that you shouldn't take your boat offshore you shouldn't do certain things with it. That's really up to the owner and the captain of the boat to decide whether he wants to go out on that day or that time. ISO has category A, B, C, and D. A being, again, offshore, fairly serious boat. That includes not only construction requirements, uh, where you're gonna put the, the windows, doors, and port lights, what type of hatches you're gonna use, how many crew it can, it can handle, how big the tanks are. They get very prescriptive with those things. And that's really a, the, the defining mark between ABYC and CE. So we have classification societies that say 500 gross tons, 300 gross tons, depending on what you're looking at. Here's what all the requirements are. And as you go through these, uh, these classification society documents, you'll see short range vessel this, all other unrestricted vessels this. So there's two different requirements there as, as you start going through it. So that's really one of the primary differences between ABYC and, uh, and CE is that intended use, if you will. Um, I can't imagine what would happen here in the United States if ABYC finally came out and said, hey, you know what, your category B vessel can only go offshore in this, 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 and this, and then someone goes offshore and there's an accident. I don't really think that the builder of the boat would be relieved from any legal requirements at that point. I just don't see it happening. So even though we have looked into it because we're looking for ABYC CE compliance in the near future or being able to use ABYC standards to meet the Recreational Craft Directive in Europe, I don't really see us going to that uh, that level of detail that the, uh, that the CE mark does. And guys, if you have questions during the middle of this, I would much rather you just kind of jump in here and stop me and we'll talk about it now because chances are when I get to the last slide, I will absolutely forget what I just said about this kind of stuff. So uh, we may backtrack, but it's just kind of the way I work. So size matters. 
in ABYC, we deal with a lot of these here. Okay, we deal with a lot of small stuff. Uh, people like to say less than 75 feet, um, but even though we don't say that, you are dealing with these kinds of things here. So class boat, non-class boat. One of the reasons this guy that wants to start up a classification society came to ABYC is because every single ISO document says it's less than how long? Anybody know? I have nothing to give you. I'm just asking if anybody's awake. It's less than 24 meters. Okay, so uh, ISO specifically states in all of their documents, recreational craft less than 24 meters. So Mr. Heinemann, who, is one, who wants to use our standards, wants to take this ISO document, use it in his classification society paradigm for a 145 foot motor yacht, what's gonna happen? He can't use it. Malta is going to reject his application for a classification society based on what the documents he's decided to use say. From an ABYC standpoint, that's not a problem, okay? ABYC does not have three-phase uh, electrical standards yet. We're working on it. So if he needs to deal with three-phase, he's gonna have to go to the IEC or somebody else, which he can do. He can put these things together cafeteria style. But when it comes to DC and AC, we got it covered. You know, as far as uh, if you go to 110 and you go to 24 volt, 32 volt, 12 volt, whatever you're using, ABYC is, is uh, fine when it comes to that kind of stuff. So he's got a task ahead of him to create this classification society, but when it comes to ISO, that very fine detail of 24 meters really, really messes it up uh, for him to try to use the ISO standards. So here's a very good example that we found. Um, in, as I think this is actually in the MCA code. So take a look at this really quickly. This is uh, doorways located above the weather deck. There is a very long definition of what a weather deck is, where it starts, where it stops. If you in your head think of a weather deck, that's probably applicable to this. But we look at unrestricted yachts, which was three, 500 gross tons, depending on what you're looking at, and short range yachts. You'll see the, uh, this is a sill height, by the way. So if you have an opportunity for water to come in over a weather deck and into the interior of the boat, there needs to be a sill height on that or, or a trip height, whatever you want to call it. A lot of people don't like those. But this is what you have to have. You'll see that it doubles from a short range yacht to, a, a, uh, to an unrestricted yacht. So we're looking at a 300 millimeter sill height if you're in location A. Location A, the door is in the forward quarter length of the vessel and is used when the vessel is at sea. So you're looking at 300 millimeters or 600 millimeters. If I gave you one of these examples, there's probably 50 others through the, stand, through the, uh, the documents that the classification societies have that differentiate between here and here. And you can see how extremely specific they get on location and sill height. Okay. I can't unequivocally go and say that they double everything for a, an unrestricted uh, versus, a, uh, versus a, a short range, but this is a very good example of, of how that one works. So again, CE versus ABYC. Let me back up a little bit there. Um, the CE versus ABYC on that, for instance, is going to be, we do have a sill height requirement. ABYC will say your sill height is this if it's in this particular location. We're just going to give them a, a full-on measurement, kind of like the classification societies do. And then the CE mark is going to go through and say, well, if you're category A, then your sill height is this. Category B, your sill height is this. Okay, category D is really a very small boat, so chances are you won't even have sill heights on that. So recreational versus commercial. Like I said before, and I want to say it again, the substantial documents that the, the classification societies had were made specifically for commercial boats. Okay, 20 years you were looking at every time a big boat will go out the door, it probably just used the commercial code. Now we're looking at specifically recreational requirements. But a lot of the recreational requirements are extremely robust. Uh, we're talking about armored cable being used throughout the boat. Why would you need that in the commercial vessel? Because you have a lot of things going on. A lot of things are flying around a commercial vessel. Things are getting loaded, unloaded. They're, they're in extreme use. But do you really need that on a 135-foot pleasure motor yacht? You know, what are the chances that those things are going to happen? Unfortunately, those requirements haven't been dropped. They're still there. So you will end up building a boat with armored cable. Okay, because that's just what you have to do, even though this is a recreational boat that's never going to see a you know, 55 foot uh, box being loaded on it somewhere. Now, it may have a helicopter landing on it, so that might be helpful, okay? But you never know. So really, there's not a lot of difference between the recreational and commercial world when it comes to these classification societies. So this guy up here has a lot in common with this one here, okay? Where maybe it really doesn't need to. 
But the insurance companies are blind. They want to make sure that whatever risk they're taking is going to be good and robust. So they're obviously going to, uh, to cite the, uh, you know, the classification society codes. The once first annual, here we got our buddy in Annapolis just kind of waving goodbye as they're heading out. That's maybe the last time that boat's ever going to see a surveyor is when it gets sold or the first time or when it gets resold. This particular boat, while it's in dry dock, I can guarantee you somewhere on there is a classification society employee with a hard hat on. He's there all the time and what's he getting? Cash. All right, he's getting paid. This is a very expensive endeavor to keep this up. If this boat's in dry dock, there, there's even standards for the glossiness of the paint. So that when the boat is, re, when the yacht is repainted, there's ways to tell whether the, the gloss is appropriate and whether it was done properly. Part of it's for the classification society, but the other part of it is so that the customer can look at it and say, you know what, that paint job is horrible, and now we have a way to actually say it's horrible and the yard has to go ahead and redo it. Okay, but there are very, very particular standards for all of the activities that are, going, that are going on during this refit that you see here in dry dock. So class versus standards, this is an excellent example of the uh, prescriptive nature of the classification society's work. Take a look at this. You don't have to read it, okay? Because it basically takes a guy that knows uh, you know, differential calculus and all sorts of other really good stuff. It takes a naval architect to figure out what we have said very simply here, which is if you want to locate a, um, a through hull, all right, it needs to be seven degrees above the maximum heeled water line or the level of shear amidships for a sailboat. That's all we say, done, ready to go. This, you need a whole lot of head scratching and headache uh, inducing type calculations. Okay, this is the way of the world for classification societies. This is what they work in. That's why the University of Michigan graduates have such great job prospects when they get out. I'm not ragging on University of Michigan. They do an excellent job. It's just they build some robust stuff. Same thing applies, and I think we already talked about this in detail. The refit and the maintenance and the upgrades are all brought in by the classification society. So the classification society is aware of everything that's happened on this boat so that they can underwrite it so the insurance company knows exactly what's going on. Okay, if you have a boat that's classed, how, how many people have sold class boats? Okay, if the class is maintained, obviously it's gonna be worth more than if the class is lapsed, correct? So you had one that was ABS in 1989 and no one's kept up with it. What are you gonna do with that boat when the person goes to sell it? Who's gonna insure it? What's gonna happen? We have the Gallery Group, which you guys are probably familiar with, calling us all the time, asking us what standards to use and, and how they should do these boats that were classed years ago and aren't classed any longer. So that happens pretty often. But again, a classification society is involved in all of us. Anybody know Ward's Marine Electric just down the street from here? All right, Ward Eshelman is our vice chair of our board and he's hitting me up all the time with classification society rules because his techs need to know them and he needs to do repairs and installs based on the classification society's work. Yes, sir. I wanted to interrupt you now so I didn't forget, but it, don't, isn't there an option to not keep it classed? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As long as you have an insurer that's going to agree to that, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, it, it re that's really the hammer here is the insurance company. That's where it all came from. And IMO, right. It also ensures the value of the boat is maintained. Absolutely. That's the point of it. Absolutely. So resale, it's terrific because, the, you know, and, and the owner knows what to expect. You know it's going to cost 20 grand a year or 60 grand a year, whatever it is, depending on the, uh, on the level. Okay. You have other questions for John? One more. Please. Um, as opposed to, like, not as I got to roll you down a little bit. I got to roll you down a little bit. Okay. Standards, or... I was, Paul was talking. What was that? Uh, hit that one again. Um, uh, United States Coast Guard inspected vessel for charter. Yes. No, that's that's going to be a mix and match. Uh, it depends on what the MSO, the Marine Safety Office, has been trained in and will accept. We are training U.S. Coast Guard officers continuously so they know our standards. It could be ours, but they can also go to the bare minimum of the 46 CFR, which is really not a lot. Yeah, cool. Um, so I am actually done here at this point. When you get a chance to take a look at this presentation, I just put some resources here for you. Um, those are some things you can go take a look at if you're interested in more reading in this incredibly interesting topic. <laughs> um, and then there's my contact information. Uh, we are happy to help at ABYC. How many members do I have in the audience? Do I have a couple? I know Chris was here a minute ago. He's a member as well. But I uh, appreciate your membership, and I hope that you found this valuable. And Paul, thank you so much. Any awesome. other questions before you? Yeah. Anybody? Oh, right we got a couple. Oh, I'm sorry, we got one in the back there. 
Hello. Um, when an engine is class sold at, on a classified boat as new, and then 10 years later, eight years later, 20 years later, and it has to be rebuilt, does it have to be reclassified through that the the classified person who did originally, uh, Lloyd's or anybody here, anything like that? Does it have to be recertified or classified as uh, rebuilt? Uh, see, an engine's a different example because an engine is always going to be EPA. So um, that really, I, I think an engine is. If he's going to if he's going to redo the entire engine room and, and ch make structural changes to the boat, then I think you're probably going to have to talk to the classification society. But I think just from a from a reinstalling, you know, and I can't answer this unequivocally because it'd be different in every situation. If it's a class boat, you're going to want to talk to the classification society before you do anything. Gentleman up in the front. There's just one comment from the captain's point of view. Uh, if you are on a class vessel. It's imperative you always speak to the class, classification society because if you lose class, it's hard to get back. And that's that's exactly what I was saying. You don't want to lose your classification society rating. It takes something as simple as adding something to the boat without getting permission prior. Right. To. Yeah, they need to know what's going on with that boat at all times. Awesome. And we have one more back there. Just just wanted to uh, clarify. The uh, paint, are you saying the classification society now is saying that there's a standard for exterior paint? Let's put it this way. There is an exterior paint application standard. Not clearly, but not. That is in existence. But the not for class. No, I can't say that. Because of all those classification societies that we talked about, there is one that I know of, and I, I don't remember the name of it, there is one that I know of that has pulled that into their list of standards, yes. Okay. Okay, and then just going back to the question on the engine, I think the captain answered it well. You know, with, with class, you not only have annual, but you have five-year um, periods of time. And those five-year special surveys, uh, if you've got to have engine work done and it's a class boat, it has to be approved by class. Yeah, or you, you will have a big problem. You don't mess with class. You, you have to keep in touch with them. Absolutely, that's awesome. a good point. Any other quick ones? One more quick one. Um, do you dictate, being a U.S. system, do you dictate the parameters for the Coast Guard and some of their designs, or you said they pick and choose? Okay, let's talk, so when you say me, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine is a uh, professional boat builder. He's building a composite day charter cat for the Caribbean. Okay. And they're still using the scantlings and overbuilding, you know, in glass that they did back 20 years ago. Right. And he's had to go back and forth with them to try and train them and say to them, look, you, know, you don't have to build this thing, it's not a battleship. And my question to you was, is that something you get involved in where you can actually bring them into the, into the current and, you know, with composites, you know, yeah. the composites over the years have gotten very good. In that particular instance, absolutely not. One, you're never going to train the Coast Guard, okay? Right. Um, so number two, ABYC does nothing with scantlings and hull thickness. We don't get involved at all. So if it was an electrical thing, yeah, maybe I could help you, but scantlings, no. And if other questions come up, John's going to be here through the rest of the day, and you're certainly welcome to catch up at a, at a break. John, thank you All very right. much. Thank you guys so much. You did Appreciate a great job. job. You did a great job. Right. Thank you.